Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Building Rapport Tips and Tricks. Um, my name is Alana Jarman. I am with Mountain Pacific. Um, this is a four-part series. This is the third of three. The next one is July 16th at 3 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Um, and they are about 30 minutes long. And I do try and leave about 30 minutes at the end for open discussion, some activities, events, tools, tips and tricks, things like that. So after the actual presentation, um, if you are able to, we're more than welcome to have you stay on. But for those of you who may need to drop off after the presentation, I am not offended. I totally understand. Some of us are excited to start our 4th of July weekend. Just a few housekeeping items. Um, muting, if you're not talking, please just make sure you're on mute. Um, I believe, um, Mary, do, do they have the ability to have camera on? Yes, they do. Okay. So if you do want to have your camera on, you're not shy, um, that is completely fine. Just be mindful of what we might see in the background. Um, also, a little bit about Mountain Pacific. Mountain Pacific is a um, company and that's based out of Helena. We are considered a quality improvement organization. We have federal contracts with Centers for Medicaid, Medicare, which that designates us as a quality improvement organization. And so we um, are graciously sharing states of Montana, Wyoming, Alaska, Hawaii, and then the US Pacific territories. So I do thank you for your time. And with that, let's get started. So today we're going to talk about how you know you're making a difference within your coalition and the effectiveness of your coalition. We'll review how empowering your organizations and stakeholders is done um, with visionary and credible efforts. Also, how your influence as a coalition is evident with how your coalition members implement and sustain your goals. Then during the last 30 minutes today, we're going to go and practice using some um, tools and, and show examples of creating um, solutions for some problems. So last session on June 18th, we talked about who facilitates a coalition and discuss what examples are of specific roles within the coalition, such as a steering committee, chairs are coalitions, coalition administrative roles, and then also the coalition members themselves. We also talked about establishing and maintaining a coalition charter to help all members understand their roles and responsibilities within a coalition. We also reviewed how alignment of goals within the organizations to which the members belong to help allocate and use your coalition resources efficiently and effectively. That included sources of data and the importance of using data to your advantage. From there, we talked about why it's important to have a way to pulse track your work by using data as well. We also gave an example of an activity that is aligning with goals and other work from another group and how this really improves the spread and sustainability of your work as a team. Then during the last 30 minutes last week, we went through an example of how to do a SMART goal. And um, I appreciate any input or conversations. And if you do have any questions, um, comments, anything like that, please uh, feel free to put them in the chat. So we have a polling question here, and I think you can go ahead and populate that, Mary. So in the um, polling question, which goal is a SMART goal? Remember that SMART stands for specific, what and who needs to be included, and what do you need to do it by, and why is this a goal? Measurable is how you will know you were successful at achieving your goal, and achievable for A, is for skills. Do you have what you need? And if not, is it possible to attain these skills needed to achieve? R is for relevant. Why are you setting it now? And does it align with your overall objectives? And then T is for time bound. It's setting a deadline realistic, realistically. Good job, everyone. <laughs> so it looks like we're meeting all the criteria so we can see the results. So 100% of you guys, I don't know how many people we have on the call, but good job. All right. So when coming together for a coalition, 
that founding purpose is the essence of the existence for the coalition in of itself. So now that we reviewed how to set the goals and importance of a charter or a participation agreement with your coalition, let's talk about how do you evaluate how efficient and effective you've been. Often I get questions like, who do I invite to the coalition? Who should lead the coalition? How do we know what to work on? And my reply is often very simple and to the point. And it goes something like this. The reason for the coalition is decided upon by the founding people or organizations working together collaboratively to find a solution. And to know who to have on the coalition will change over time based on what objective or strategy you may be working on during that time. And what to work on is based off the mission and vision of your coalition. When you want to know whether you made a difference within your coalition is through evaluation. A lot of skepticism revolves around evaluation because it does take time and resources to put it together, analyze and apply the findings. One of the biggest reasons why people get frustrated with evaluations is once you do it, and if no one does anything with it, then there really was no point to actually spend the time and resources to conduct it. I have colleagues that call it analysis paralysis, which I think is hilarious but unfortunately is the case for a lot of work groups, organizations, and coalitions. Some tips on how to improve engagement with evaluation is putting action with it, with everyday work, so that it helps the coalition members see the value in it. Also, by using it to guide the conversation, we're getting the coalition members to talk about next steps as a team. Say to them, how can it improve our work or influence potential partners stakeholder or organizations, or even help with increasing resources, such as funding for your work. And by doing this regularly and showing the data to approve the interventions or actions taken by the coalition made a difference, then the engagement along with recruitment intention will improve as well. This also gives partners, stakeholders, and other key community partners a sense of accountability to the coalition as well as the coalition showing how their work has affected change for the community. Another tip with evaluations is using previous evaluation efforts as examples to debrief and talk about what has gone well or what challenges there were in the process. Some other evaluation downfalls to watch for are things like not using the results to evaluate for what you're doing the work for, when it comes to data and evaluation, I throw strong caution with using results to make decisions without understanding why that data was pulled, why it was pulled for, and what source it came from, when it was analyzed, because having data that is too outdated is a concern, where the data came from, like a legitimate source or credible source, and then it wasn't illegally shared, and how that data is relevant to your scope of work and goals for the coalition. Another thing to watch for is hidden agendas. I know that it's assumed that everyone that comes to a coalition is coming to help with the cause and the greater good, but if there's a concern from the coalition members that the vehicle to evaluate, maybe to push a concealed purpose, then a process determine whether the intent is appropriate to help is held to the coalition. If the evaluation process is not vetted and the coalition members along with organizations they may represent, may become skeptical of the purpose and power of the coalition. Constructive criticism is not always welcomed, especially if the organization or group is being evaluated was not part of the process to identify the problem and decided how to measure it with data and then the evaluation or results of the problem points fingers to an organization and that can cause the coalition to lose rapport with them and upset the relationship, which leads to the next point of power imbalances within the coalition. If you have a powerful player or actor member, however you term it in your coalition, there can be an uneven distribution and in influence and say within the coalition, which can lead to dissatisfied members causing disengagement among many other consequences of the imbalance of power within your coalition. Then last, when black and white data tells you something, but you do the opposite action or inappropriate action or intervention, 
you're not actually solving any problems, but rather creating more. So what are some ways to deter those previous downfalls? When you're researching and identifying what problems you need to find solutions for within your community, it's important to know whether your coalition is the one that should lead the charge or whether there is another group that would have more resources and aligns better with their purpose. Although another group may lead the work, understanding what the complete problem list is helps everyone pool in and help find a solution. Then when it comes time to evaluate and knowing when to evaluate, try asking these questions. What's the frequency of the problem and how long has it been lasting for? What about who it affects? Is it specific to proportions of the community or is it the entire community or rather a state? Then how severe is the problem? Is it very disruptive? Is it affecting health outcomes? For example, health inequity, not everyone receiving the same care. Then the question, other question to go back to power imbalances or hidden agendas, is the problem, is it a real problem or is it a lack of someone or some organization not doing what they're actually supposed to do? This is a great reason why building and maintaining partnerships is so important to the work of your coalition. Think about who the problem affects such as social classes, gender, race and ethnicity, sexual orientation, age, religion, and culture, among other considerations. If the problem affects a large proportion of a certain group of people, this is where you wanna be strategic with your recruitment, or at least who you talk with to understand the root cause of the problem. In order for people to stay motivated and become and remain engaged, you must do a little recon with your community and know your community and who lives and breathes in it. Also, just because there may be a, ver a very imminent problem, there's also strength within a community and do not forget to acknowledge that. So doing an inventory of what personal skills and talents coalition members have is how you utilize all your resources to their fullest potential. We did this at Mountain Pacific and help identify team members who may have more experience or comfort with doing certain tasks in our work. This is something you would want your coalition members to do right away when joining the coalition. So leaders understand and know their strengths and weaknesses and how to address their opportunities and threats. For example, if someone is outgoing, have them do public speaking, or maybe if they're a little shy and quiet, maybe they would just be great note takers. So not only with your coalition members, but as an entire coalition structure to assess the characteristics, such as assess, are the leaders committed to the mission and vision of the coalition? Are they flexible and accepting different viewpoints? Do they have time to devote to the coalition and recognize members for their contributions? For the members, do they clearly understand their roles and responsibilities? and the expectations to attend and engage during coalition meetings? Do they have a sense of accomplishment and seek out opportunities to improve the coalition structure or help with achieving the goals? For the coalition structure, are there bylaws and rules of operation and writing, as well as your mission, vision, purpose, and goals, are they stated? Are there subcommittees and steering committees and, and how are they structured? How about is there a process for voting and conduct regular evaluations for resources and processes? How about is there an orientation process for new members or just to reorientate or kick off your coalition that's been stagnant? Another tool to use is doing a personality test of all your members so you can understand each other a little bit better, their communication styles, or just how they approach their work. We also did this at Mount Pacific and it's actually pretty fun to do. And you, if you're looking for one, I think if you Google it, some of them, there is a cost and some of them are free. A dear colleague and I were having a conversation about oh, a little over a year ago, and we were actually talking about trauma-informed care. And she recited a statement that she had, re, um, she had read in, a, in an article regarding trust and I'm paraphrasing it a little bit here. 
She said, a lot of people feel that in order to build a relationship is that you have to prove your competence first to gain trust. When it's actually the opposite, you must first gain trust to show your competence. So when we think about a coalition, we generally think of it as a whole unit rather than the individual serving in it. So in the chat box, type a word that you would describe someone you trust. How would you describe that person in just one word? Trust provides a sense of safety, which then allows for more reciprocal actions with each other. Once you trust someone, you are more likely to share knowledge, which builds capacity and creates collaboration and productivity. Um, a study published in the Journal of Knowledge Management found that trust was a key element in a team's knowledge acquisition. So if your coalition struggles with communication, you may find the root cause could be lack of trust. Let's see what everybody's putting in the chat box here. I see some people are. Honesty, friend, open. Yep, reliable, thank you, yeah. And when I think of, of somebody, I would definitely say reliable. I trust their reliability for sure. You know that saying, do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> if you expect your team to be reciprocal, then you need to set the example. Even though right now we're doing, we're all really trying our best to physically distance from each other, that doesn't mean that you need to socially isolate. Prior to our new normal, we were meeting face to face and things were a little bit different and it was easier to reach out or to walk to someone's office and talk through something. Now, not so much. So when we're doing everything virtually, if you're busy, have a way to indicate that. Or if you're going to be out of office, let your team know. And just because we're meeting virtually doesn't mean that you start the meeting, don't put yourself on camera, and then unlock your iPhone and start scrolling through Facebook. You want your team to be engaged as well as leaders. We need to show what that means. I can't stress enough how important communication is to the success of your coalition. This includes having your structure in place, such as a charter, so that everyone knows their expectations of the coalition and of each other. Do you have a method for members to express concerns or ask questions if they aren't comfortable doing so during the coalition meetings? If a coalition member reaches out to you as leaders, are you responsive? I sure hope so. And just a few more things regarding skills inventory and team building. Some of the principles of adult learning, which also applies to relationships, is it involves having direction towards a clear, defined goal, and that it's relevant and practical, and acknowledgement of the experience of the adult individual is heard and listened to. So when it comes to the problems or issues or anything that your team has identified and identified to work on, there are multiple moving pieces to ensure a uniform and diplomatic approach to working together to find a solution. If in the process of researching the root cause of the problem, a team member maybe made a mistake, don't place blame, but rather use that opportunity to identify how the mistake happened. It could be something systematic that could have happened to anyone, including you. Who would love to go back in time to junior high or high school? Not me. If there was one thing really that sticks out as a bad experience was all the social cliques. But even today, I see certain cliques in adult circles. And they're often isolating to someone and can be very disrupting and damaging to the relationship or to the coalition. So as a coalition leader, do your best to call out and discourage these behaviors. And finally, if there are trust issues, don't just let it happen. Find out why. That elephant isn't invited to everything. So for those of you who don't mind standing in front of three or 300 people, then public speaking is your bag, baby. But there are some people that would rather go cliff jumping than hop on a stage and talk or sing. So from experience, I can say the more you prepare and practice, the more comfortable you are with your content and can speak to it fluently. Although PowerPoint's what I'm using right now, there are other ways to, to actually speak in public. 
And I'm using this tool because honestly, I don't really trust my technology or technology skills or connectivity enough to use um, other interactive ways to present. So when you deliver your message or education, knowing who you'll be talking to is just as important. Um, and then, so if you're putting that jargon in or maybe acronyms in the talk, there may be people who don't know what that means. So be sure you choose your words wisely because the talk isn't for, is for the audience, not you. It's also been said that if you grab your um, audience attention within the first 30 seconds, and then you don't wanna talk longer than 30 minutes at a time. But if you do talk longer than 30 minutes, be sure you're watching cues from your audience like yawning, fidgeting, or working on a laptop, which is difficult to do when you're in virtual, but hence the cameras, but I'm, I'm definitely not one of those people who likes to be on camera. <laughs> also, don't try to be someone you're not. If you're trying to impersonate someone on purpose is one thing like a comedian, but when you don't let your light shine through your true personality, more times than not, it's distracting and your message doesn't come across how you intended it. I used to watch Rachel Ray every morning when I was on maternity leave and she said something during her show one time that has stuck me for, well, let's see, 12 years, because that's how young or old my youngest is. And she said, there are two things that you can do about it, laugh or cry, and both are just fine. There are topics that laughter would be very inappropriate and maybe crying is. One of the things that I have read about regulating emotions and mental health is our body naturally will do what it's supposed to. And if you need to cry, then cry. But those times when you're presenting in person and you trip on your own foot, yes, embarrassing, I know, because I've done it, um, making a joke out of it, laughing it out with the audience, well, you may have just actually made someone's day by giving them a little humor. And last, but for sure not least, as I already had mentioned before, technology, don't be scared of it. You have to befriend it because if you don't, you'll actually end up in the dark and sometimes literally. So when you're preparing, also be sure you're anticipating technology glitches. So you have a plan B in case you don't have your PowerPoint slides up on the screen and if you wanted to use a video, practice pulling it up ahead of time. Check the sound, make sure it's actually the correct video. So I know this is a little bit short. I think we're only in, in about 20, 25 minutes here. So for those of you who wanna jump off and maybe start your weekend early, that I, I am not offended by any means. But if you do want to stay on, um, we're going to do some open sharing for the last 30 minutes. So the last session for this training is going to take place on July 16th, and we're going to focus around goal setting, strategy and tactic planning, along with how the mission and vision, as well as your defined roles and responsibilities, affect the success of your coalition. We're planning for another series, actually, um, of coalition training around data. And once we have more details, we'll be sure to get that out, um, most likely via email or constant contact. But in the meantime, if any of you have questions, please, please, please don't hesitate to reach out to your Mount Pacific contact or myself with that. So in the chat box, Mary has posted an evaluation link. So if you wouldn't mind, if you are um, not able to join us for this last 30 minutes, um, if you wouldn't mind filling out that evaluation i sure would appreciate it so with that does anybody have any questions comments feel free to just speak up and just to, um unmute yourself let me see alana this is crystal and i um have a comment um i found it helpful to uh do the the inventory of personalities in our Casper coalition. And I have found um, a lot of um, diamonds in the rough, let, let's say that. So uh, again, they, they found the activity to be fun. And uh, some people in my coalition members uh, have, have uh, really been um, very valuable and resourceful. And I wouldn't have known it if I didn't do that inventory. Yeah, no, I appreciate you sharing that because 
um, even when we did it within Mountain Pacific. So Crystal is a, a fellow colleague of mine and we did this for our, we had meetings about a, I don't even know, I, I don't even know what I did yesterday, about six months ago, I think, eight months. Anyway, it was fun because we all, it was just, you know, we thought we knew each other pretty well, but then once we started doing these, it was like, oh, I didn't know that about you. So I agree. It's very useful. And like I had said, um, exactly diamond in the rough, finding resources and things that you would have never guessed. Like maybe somebody's like a master gardener or, you know, just random things like that. So thank you for sharing that, Crystal. And I do have a question from Julie. Are slides going to be available? Yes, all of these um, sessions are recorded as well as the PowerPoints. Is that correct, Mar Mary? I'm speaking correctly. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's being recorded and will be available hopefully by the end of next week. Thank you. So that, I think that answers your question, Julie. Anybody uh, have any other comments or questions before we start our activity? And it, you, this is a pretty um, informal too. So if you do have a question, just don't be shy, just speak up. So I was gonna go through this activity. So I'm just gonna kind of set the stage with talking about a specific community and how some local um, organizations came together to form a coalition and talking about their process on how they defined a problem and um, what they need to do to work towards it. So, so this is Pleasantville, USA. I know it's kind of a, <laughs> it's kind of a funny name. I think of that movie. Um, it's a moderately sized town with about 10 to 11,000 people in the community. The economy is largely based off of agriculture and a little bit of tourism. The town has two smaller hospitals um, and the community kind of considers another town close to it as part of the community and two nursing homes and one assisted living facility. In the past three to four years, the community has been seeing a slight increase in the population with mainly younger families coming back to be near parents and grandparents. Recently, one of the families bought a few different older apartment buildings and began to renovate it. But in the process, of course, the price of rent increased as well to many of the current tenants dismay. Also due to supply and demand, the housing market had an increase in price as well, which was Great for the sellers, but not so much for the buyers. The local hospitals, nursing homes, and assisted living facilities were happy to see younger families moving in, and some were in the healthcare profession. Although there were more people moving into Pleasantville, the cost of living had increased slightly, but wages had not, and remaining the same. Also, due to more demand for childcare, daycare centers were also maxed out with their capacity. The local hospitals were experiencing an increase in applicants as well as the nursing home assisted living, but we're still noticing some wax and waning of their staff. So meet, this is Pleasantville Health Improvement Coalition. The history of the coalition goes back to about a year ago. The two different hospitals began to notice that staffing was beginning to be a problem as long as, as well as recruitment and retention. Both organizations also began to track their medication errors with patients coming in for appointments and noticing some discrepancies with how patients were taking their medications, including um, missing pain medications. They began transitioning um, to the same EHR incidentally, but with some difficulty with it. At about the same time, local nursing homes and assisted living facilities we're also noticing some discrepancies with medications for the residents, as well as confusion with discharge plans and instructions from residents returning from the hospital. With the work of a few case managers and social workers within each organization, they began to notice similarities with their problems and decided to host a community healthcare organization call in which both hospitals, as well as the local nursing homes and a few of the home health agencies and the assisted living were invited. During this meeting, the issues were discussed, research was done on their community and state, stated similarities with their issues, 
and it was decided to form a community coalition for their healthcare organizations. During the third monthly coalition meeting, they had come up with a mission, vision, purpose for the coalition, a name, and objectives. So now they met, started their name and charter, there was still confusion as to what the actual problem was and how to identify the root cause. So far, the coalition has identified the need for collaboration and know there are similar problems occurring in the community healthcare organizations. They've also elected um, leaders for the coalition, started their charter with their, all their roles, responsibilities, everything named out uh, for all members, um, created a structured meeting time and platform, obtained contact information for all their members. They're in the process of understanding the needs, resources, including data resources. Um, so with all members of the coalition, they feel they have a good sense of the community history, relationships among organizations. One area they are unsure about is how this recent influx of new community members moved into Pleasantville is really affecting their health outcomes. So they're conducting interviews, surveys, getting a qualitative method in place to assess the community issues. This process has taken them about two months for all uh, coalition members to contribute time to do, but it's necessary to conduct to understand the how and why questions for the community culture and get the underlying realities of the problems and allows for that human factor, whereas quantitative assessment would not reveal this type of information. So anybody have any questions up to this point? No. All right. So the nature of problems is that most times people know there is a problem, but not sure how to solve it or how to start. So as I stated above, the coalition started with what they know, began to analyze qualitative assessment in the community and within their organizations, and also are starting to gather data they have access to. So once you do that, then you come up with a problem statement to define and focus the problem. And this is called clarifying the problem. And you can do so by either in person meeting or if you're virtual, um, if you're in person, you can do this on like a whiteboard or virtual, you're gonna be emailing it out. And this allows everyone an opportunity to provide input and feedback. So once you do that, do you have the right people sitting at the table to start talking about and how to address the problem. Let me see, there's a few chat. Happy 4th of July, yes, no worries. Um, all right, so how is this a problem? How is this for a problem statement? And what, we, what they came up with, well, actually, I came up with it. Medication errors have been increasing in Pleasantville among all healthcare organizations. So would everyone agree that this is a statement that's not placing blame. It's a good starting point to help frame how to start working on it. Does anybody have any suggestions how to reframe that problem statement? Or any questions? So deciding to solve the problem, it comes with a few criteria to consider as well. Once you decide how to frame your actual problem, is this within the scope of your coalition? Does it align with the purpose of the coalition? Is there possibly a better organization or work group that may be more suitable to handle the problem? But for this sake, we have decided as a coalition that we are the most appropriate group to start working on solving this problem. Analyzing the problem involves finding the root cause and analyzing. Doing this involves asking those what, why, who, when, and how much, and we have the problem statement identified, so we need to ask those additional questions. Now we're at the why does it exist? Has anyone um, on this call used the asking the five why? I think we've called it the five whys or asking why five times before. Does anybody use that within their organizations? Is that the Toyota Lean model? Yeah, I think it may have come from it, but I, it's um, not necessarily a lean process, but I mean, it, it can be part of it for 
but it's just you asking, um, you know, why, why is there medication errors? You know, and then you state the problem and then you ask why again, and you keep asking why. So doing so helps identify the root cause and can help understand what data you might be missing, as well as people you might want to include in your problem solving. Um, doing a root cause can also help with individual factors like knowledge, awareness, behavior, and then social causes like cultural factors such as custom and belief, customs and beliefs, and then economic factors like money, real estate, and also political factors. So, I did create a little tool to help guide us. Oh, that's the charter. So if anybody wants to see the charter, this might look familiar to a few. Um, this was created, um, Mountain Pacific team created this during our last, last um, CMS task order. And I just kind of modified it a little bit. So if anybody wanted to see, it's very similar to what um, what was created the last time. So if anybody also, if you are, anybody needs examples of coalition charters and you just wanna see some examples, we're happy to share some past ones with you as well. And here we go. So can everybody see this? So we have in the center here, we have, we have our problem statement is increase in medication errors. So why are there medication errors? So some people just either type it in the chat box or just shout it out. So why are some reasons why we would have medication errors? New nurses, okay. Unqualified staff for medication administration, education. Okay, unclear discharge orders. Time management. Med recon not complete. Um, gaps in patient knowledge. Interruptions. Do that. Okay, well, I'm just going to leave it. I had done it before, I'm trying to add another shape. Oh well, uh, more education. Okay, so we've identified quite a few here. We have new nurses, lack of education training unclear discharge orders, time management, med recon done improper, um, is it improper? <laughs> Gap in patient knowledge and interruptions. Okay, so we have these. So new nurses, why would this be a problem with medication errors with new nurses? Training, not not properly trained. Or perhaps they're on a floor that they're not used to working on. Okay. So then what I would do for each of these is I would I would just kind of go down each one of them. So if we just take this one, let's just call it new nurses. We'll just do this one for the sake of time. So if we, new nurses, let's 
So why, why would um, training be done improperly? What are some reasons why training is done improperly? Staffing shortages, traveling staff, Okay. Lack of times, Kyla's saying. Okay. Poor preceptor, mentor, mentor um, passing on bad habits. That's so true. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. Been there, I've seen that. I've seen it yeah I've been there <laughs> been there done it or, yeah, yeah not done it but I've been there and I've seen it yep and shortcuts and yeah you know, hard stops and people come up with how to get around the hard stops yep been there so why why is all of this staff shortages um travel all of these why would that be an issue like what if are, are we done not used to caring for 15 resident ratio. Okay, so when we come up with, with all of these new nurses, why? Training done improperly, why? Because there's probably staffing shortages, travel, contract staff, lack of time, poor preceptor, bad habits. So when I think of this, what do you guys think would be the root cause of this? Staffing shortages, all of this, to me, this sounds like a systematic issue. It's not necessarily um, a community-based or, or one person or anything like that. Do we maybe need to work on orientation process? You know, I, I talked about our wages. Is that an issue? Maybe we want to create incentives. Is there sign-on bonuses? I know in the past I've worked at facilities that um, in order, you know, especially rural facilities, I came from North Dakota, where it like you're literally in the middle of almost nowhere. And to try and get staff to come, you do sign-on bonuses. You also do tuition, payment, re um, forgiveness, things like that. So has anybody seen good luck with that? You know, like these are the kind of things that we would want to explore as a coalition. Understand, you know, the, the um, benefits and, and challenges with That's each of those. I've worked at places, Alana, where they've offered an incentive for a referral bonus. So if you refer someone and they get hired on, stay for, I think it was six months, then I got a bonus. Yep. So kind of, kind of a dual incentive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you f find that, you know, beneficial? Heck yeah. I got 500 <laughs> bucks out of the deal and I think she got 1500. So, I yeah. mean. Yeah, it was beneficial. Yep. Yep. So another thing that I would think of too, when I think of not, you know, training not done properly, who would I want to talk with to figure out, you know, as in terms of lack of time or poor preceptor or patient to nurse ratio, who is, a, who is the like direct person I'd really want to talk to and figure out what what the real causes are and like some other factors that we may not be considering. How about the nurses themselves? And again, you say that with caution because um, sometimes um, nurses will be like, I don't want to stir the pot or I don't want to put my foot in my mouth, um, you know, like other things like that. So there's always those, those, those other factors that may kind of inhibit survey the nurses. Yeah, 
That's one way. And so with the coalition, when they were putting out those surveys and those kind of interviews and assessments to figure out the problems, you know, that's one way that you could do it. You could survey, you could um, provide anonymous ways for people to provide feedback. So you get that real, that realistic, the raw reasons. So what are some solutions to identify? We already started kind of talking about them. Facilities may want to view themselves as, as an extension of their education. There are many aspects that schooling does not teach or may not, may not, may only touch on. I agree with that. Looks at the settings where it's happening most often. Yeah. Look at how it's being tracked. Yeah. Just in time training. What, what do you mean just in time training? Are you able to unmute yourself? No. <laughs> oh, shoot. V Bruns, are we able to unmute her? Let's see. Um, maybe you don't have, oh, there you go. Now you're unmuted. Do you have audio? Nope. Um, solution, listen to their feedback, implement suggestions, no audio headphones. Oh, shoot, sorry about that. Anybody familiar with just-in-time training? Nope. So yeah. So when we think about solutions and when we talk about brainstorming um, to kind of bring up this again. So before you start and you're, you're coming up with solutions, um, consider factors such as like open communication, facilitation skills, understanding how to encourage engagement and participation with your coalition, in which we've also previously reviewed in those, pre in those other sessions. Um, generating solutions, it is a process. It takes time and patience. Um, one of the ways to start, as I was just referring to, is brainstorming, and then this is allowing people to come up with ideas on a solution. And whether you're virtual or in person, is a good way to start the process. And so some caution with assuming, don't assume you know or don't assume um, anything, make sure you clarify so that when people are putting um, suggestions or um, ideas in, like I, just as I was talking about just in time training, which she did clarify, she said just in time training, doing random auditing, make corrections at that moment, non-punitive educational way of training, gotcha. Um, and encourage creative thinking. Remember, thinking outside the box is highly encouraged, especially when there's when there's reoccurring problems. And you know, a lot of the times we're trying to put, we keep putting band-aids on top or you know, masking tape on top of something that definitely won't hold. Um, everyone should have equal say. We want to discourage naysaying and allow people to finish their thoughts before we interject. Um, evaluating solutions is also another process. It takes time and patience. Uh, that's carefully analyzing each solution that the member stated and by looking at pros and cons, practicality, effectiveness, and making sure they're efficient, feasible, and among other considerations, but you get the point. Um, so making a decision takes a strong voice and using the da that data that you were able to gather to choose which solutions to pursue and set into action. Traditional training usually delivered in one or more longer sessions. Gotcha. Thanks. Thank you, Kyla and Mark. Perfect. All right. So when we think about um, our stated problems, and we came up with, I'm trying to pull that up again here. 
training um, properly, not done properly. I should put not. As we said, staffing shortages, travel contract, staff, lack of time, poor preceptor, bad habits, encourage patient to nurse ratio. So we talk about all of, all of those and we can go through each one of these, but like I said, for the sake of time. So when I say, what are some solutions to these identified causes to the problem? What are some, some creative solutions? How could we address staffing shortages or lack of time, poor, poor preceptorship? Uh, they could be a model hospital for um, training. So uh, do you know what I mean by that? Um, training facilities where they recruit nurses when they're done. Make, like a magnet hospital? Are you talking yeah. about like a model? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? And see, the process is you definitely want to, you know, we're all kind of new to each other, but in the process of forming the coalition and doing the, the personality and the kind of skills um, inventory and things like that is that we get to know each other and we get to know kind of each other's experience. And so this would be a way where I would know, um, let's just say I would call on Sarah Lake and I knew that she could do X, Y, Z and ask her what is her opinion. Um, but also to the point where you want the, the coalition or the group to feel comfortable with being able to talk and not feel um, stupid for saying something. So that, that's definitely part of that trust building and that rapport building with your coalition members. So when we talk about just-in-time training, Let's use both of these. What are some things that we would need to consider? And what I mean is when we put our plan into action, um, this helps to ensure that we have all our bases covered and we're starting to prepare and anticipate challenges or barriers. So how do you implement your solution? Setting up the strategies to help ensure the objective is met for the problem involves following the questions. What actions or changes? Who will carry out the changes? By when and by how long? What other resources are needed to carry out the changes? Also communication. Who should need to know what and who else do we need to communicate with? So putting these strategies into plan, well now we have the makings of a strategic plan for our coalition. And just because we decided on a certain way, that doesn't mean that things have to stay that way and that we won't have those fluctuations because a lot of the times, as we all know, healthcare is a very volatile environment and can change in the matter of a day. So you may have to adjust your plan accordingly. Also at evaluating what's happened, um, what can go wrong and what to do about it. Um, you know, even if you're doing, um, putting into action, putting maybe possibly a SWOT analysis in place. So pulling this back up. So we said just in time training and using magnet hospital methodology. So we look at who will carry out the changes, by when, what resources are needed, and communication. So for just in time training versus magnet hospital methodology. Has anybody had experience with that kind of um, organization, like magnet hospital? Yeah, it's, it's, it's somewhat hard to achieve. So I guess I would maybe back up and just say that we would be a, uh, I don't know what, because I've, I've worked in a few hospitals where they weren't magnets, um, they didn't have magnet status, but they were, they opened it up for the nursing schools to be, um, do their um, practicum or I don't know what, what do nurses call it when they go do their Yep, the practicums. Their practicum, yeah, their practicum yep. work. And they weren't, they weren't magnet status. They, and we ended up retaining about half of the um, staff that came over there. 
yeah. or half of the nursing students that um, came over. Yep. Yeah, and you know, and I think there there definitely is a process, but I I appreciate the fact that you brought that up, Crystal, because. Um, I've been a part of an organization that was in the process of starting it and it is a, you know, it's like a, it takes years to do because you have to set things in motion and you have to kind of um, mitigate and fix a lot of problems internally like staffing shortages and things like that and um, that orientation. So, you know, when we think um, about what we've defined in our coalition, what do we have access to? What are some realistic things? Like, so when we talk about just in time training, what role or what actions can we as a coalition take to help with just in time training? Would it be education? Would it be, what would that involve? What exactly are we gonna wanna do with just in time training? I guess I don't know what that is, so I don't, I can't, I don't know. So, oh, I'm reading Mark's comments right now. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So being able to, I agree with, yeah, that's, um, I guess I don't, I don't know if I've heard that before or not. I'm having early onset dementia, I think. Um, Using that opportunity, you know, I've done that before as a nursing supervisor when I see somebody um, doing a procedure, for instance, and um, they may either be taking a shortcut around it and not following protocol or may have missed a step just because of, um, you know, they, they just completely forgot because of the human factor. Kyla said maybe you could use Maybe you could see if the nursing association could distribute information about the training. That's a very good suggestion. So who, if we talked about who is gonna carry it out. So maybe we're gonna collaborate with state nursing association or possibly the hospital has a, a nursing um, committee because sometimes they have like clinical ladder type committees and things like that for, um, for nurses. So maybe you could do that. So who? By when? When do we want to? When we think about the problem, how severe is it? How widespread? Is it urgent that we do this? So now remember that we're, we're going back to medication errors. So when we think about our solutions and we think about um, asking the five whys, remember we're trying to trace it back to, thanks Mark for joining, happy 4th of July weekend. Um, think back to medication errors. How does that, thank you. And don't be shy to speak up. Hey, this is Kyla. Sure. I'm just thinking um, a lot of times there's so many like um, drug interaction messages or alerts that come up that you get um, what they call. Um, like hard stops, you mean? Like, yeah, like a, a fatigue of having things flagged when they're not as critical. So maybe, you know, looking at those alerts and seeing if, you know, the most critical ones are really standing out or if there's too many, because I know a lot of the systems I worked on at the pharmacy flag a lot of things that really aren't that clinically significant. And so you get in the habit of just kind of blowing through some of the potential alerts. So yep. maybe just looking at the EHR and seeing, you know, what level. And I think you can change the level on, on some of the systems to make it a higher level or lower threshold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think that's a really good point, um, Kyla, is that I, I definitely saw that before too. And, you know, that's another consideration, like another um, conversation, do we need to bring in the EHR vendor and, and ask them, you know, how, how is this being bypassed and, you know, how can you make it so that this XYZ has to happen? Amber says, I think it's always good to draw a process map, lean first step. It's a good point. Yep, doing a process map. So we're going back up to when. So this is kind of setting our tone. Um, when will they take place and for how long? Kind of basing it off what resources we have internally as a coalition. How much time do we have? Things like that. So for the sake of time, I see that I am actually a minute over. So I apologize for those of you who are maybe needing to drop off or get to the next call. Um, I hope this was a beneficial um, session for you guys. And I hope that you're all able to join the July 16th call. And again, definitely in the meantime, if you have any questions, like I said, reach out to your Mountain Pacific contact or that my, I put my email address up there you're looking for tools, resources, a question just to bank ideas off, um, that's what we're here for. So with that, I hope you all have a very fun and safe 4th of July. Remember your sunscreen and um, best wishes to all of you. <laughs>